Hello and good day to you. This is Tracy Harrison from the School of Applied Functional Medicine. I want to invite all progressive healthcare practitioners to come and join us here at the School of Applied Functional Medicine, where we uncover and share really important practitioner tips for maximizing your clinical effectiveness through the functional medicine lens. We know so, so many root causes of disease, mediators of disease can be found in our daily choices, whether it's diet or stress or sleep or relationships. Uh, all of these habits, right? Personal hygiene, beauty products, uh, mindset, so many different aspects of our day-to-day -day lives can contribute to promoting progressive manifestation of various diseases, especially so many of the chronic inflammatory disease dynamics that are prevalent in our practices. But we often don't think about medications everyday drugs that so many of the individuals in your practices are taking as being a likely contributor to a disease dynamic. We're going to talk about key considerations that we believe all modalities need to be aware of so that as you're looking through the functional medicine lens at a unique case, you can be prepared to understand where a medication, perhaps a long used and well intended, well prescribed medication may actually right now at this time be actively promoting functional imbalance and downstream progressive disease worsening in a unique individual. Here at SAFM, we are privileged. It's a great pleasure pleasure to be able to support continuous education for 22 different professional medical and wellness modalities hailing from over 75 countries around the world. And you're all very welcome here. I want to dive right in uh, on this topic because there are many different medications we could speak of. And in fact, if we were to cast a broad net and consider some of the even more esoteric medications, we could do a many hour webinar here on this topic. But I wanted to focus in particular on some of the most common medications, the things that are so commonplace, we often, even as practitioners, lose sight of the risk of disease exacerbation. These are things that individuals may have been taking for many months, years, or even decades. Some of them are prescribed. Some of them are widely available over the counter. And we know that many of our patients tend to assume that if a medication is available at a local drugstore, uh, it must be benign, right? It must be innocuous enough to continue to take on an ongoing basis. And uh, we know that the truth um, may actually be uh, quite surprising to them. This is where your ability to keenly look at a unique case, understand where medications may be a challenge, and engage in education, inspiration, and empowerment with a unique patient in order to understand where alternative remedies or therapies may be valuable or even necessary if they are to make continuous progress on reversing the disease challenges that they're wrestling with. Um, but I want to start by talking about, first of all, hypertension an oh-so-common disease dynamic that many individuals are wrestling with. Uh, I was meeting with a uh, physician the other day who was sharing that he's just of the belief that pretty much everybody eventually gets hypertension, right? It's just a matter of time before everyone is taking a beta blocker or before everyone uh, needs to consider um, uh, angiotensin receptor blocker in order to just weather the, the ravages of aging, which is an interesting reflection on our defaults, uh, the expected outcomes from our progressive lifestyle choices. Hyper and so as a result, hypertension medications are incredibly common and often individuals are not just taking one, but they may be taking multiple medications in order to keep their day over day blood pressure in a seemingly optimal zone in order to minimize the wear and tear uh, on our um, arteries in particular, but on all of our blood vessels and the work that our heart has to do in order to support our cardiovascular needs. 
But there are nutrient depletions and biochemical interactions that are really important consider, to consider for these medications. In particular, beta blockers, uh, incredibly common medication uh, for uh, just simply calming the effects of the sympathetic nervous system mode, minimizing the stimulatory effects of epinephrine and norepinephrine, and often prescribed for individuals who might be struggling with stress. But there are two critical nutrients depletions that you want to keep in mind. The first of them is CoQ10. Many of us are familiar with the particular risk of statin medications. The actual mode of action for these medications impairs the body's synthesis of coenzyme Q10, which is an absolutely critical cofactor in the uh, electron transport chain in the mitochondria of our cells to make ATP to run the body pretty uh, dramatic challenge. Um, but um, coenzyme Q10 is also an essential antioxidant in the body. Many practitioners don't realize that it's not just essential for ATP synthesis, but it's a, a critical antioxidant both uh, for the mitochondria themselves and also for protection of the cell membrane. Uh, particularly uh, a notable need given all of the toxic and oxidative insults that our cell membranes are exposed to on a regular basis. But you might be surprised to learn that research shows us that beta blockers are another class of medications that interfere with the body synthesis of coenzyme Q10. And this can be a real double whammy when individuals have um, different stages of metabolic uh, syndrome or cardiovascular disease where they may be using a beta blocker and a statin drug. Uh, definitely want to keep this in mind where there may be a real need to supplement with notable doses of coenzyme Q10, and especially with the reduced ubiquinol form for individuals as they age and may lose the ability to make the uh, conversion between the oxidated and oxidated, um, oxidized and reduced forms of this critical antioxidant. Another key consideration for beta blockers is their impact on melatonin. And this is unfortunately a powerful example of where a medication that is being taken to try to manage some of the aspects of a given diagnosis or a given disease dynamic may actually over time with ongoing use end up exacerbating some of the very aspects of the disease that they were originally prescribed to support. And this may surprise you because we often think of melatonin as just being an essential hormone for sleep, right? Courtesy of the pineal gland, we look for melatonin in order to rise as we move into the later evening and to promote good, deep, restful sleep, which is, of course, healing to the body. But melatonin is also another powerful antioxidant. And in fact, being able to secrete ample amounts of melatonin in the middle of the night so that we can experience a dramatic drop in blood pressure overnight that allows for healing of the, the precious endothelial lining of our blood vessels is an essential part of reducing the downstream negative effects of um, elevated blood pressure and keeping the worsening of hypertension from occurring. We want to have good copious amounts of melatonin surging in our bodies at night. We want to be big dippers and to experience a significant drop in blood pressure uh, overnight. But this is where a beta blocker medication can actually interfere with this particular challenge. And so um, two key considerations for a fairly everyday blood pressure medication. Um, uh, and a great opportunity to consider the needs of the unique individual. Often beta blockers are prescribed where there's stress-mediated hypertension, and often those are the individuals who most need to have good, deep, restful sleep as a way of protecting their body from the effects of all of that stress. 
diuretics, we have certainly learned more and more over the past five to 10 years uh, that while they're commonplace in the management of hypertension, they can have some pretty insidious effects with regard to interfering with electrolyte sufficiency in the body. And for a long time, we believed that the electrolytes only had effect primarily on sodium and water. Uh, but we know that electrolytes can actually have a dramatic impact on potassium and magnesium levels as well. Two electrolytes that are essential for helping us to have optimal blood pressure. And so another example where the medications may actually be in the way. Uh, I attended a wonderful lecture um, over a decade ago now, where I remember hearing Dr. Mark Houston talking about diuretic mediated magnesium depletion, which of course promotes hypertension and an unfortunate additional example of the cyclical nature where a medication may be of great benefit short term, but with ongoing use can actually exacerbate the very disease dynamic that was originally prescribed for. Speaking of magnesium, we know it's an essential mineral and one that is often less uh, uh, sufficient in our patients and clients, in part because it's less prevalent in the soil and minerals in our food come from the soil. And if it's uh, less available in the soil, of course, it's going to be less available in our foods. On top of that, stress encourages not only utilization of magnesium, for example, for the metabolism of stress hormones, but stress also promotes increased loss of magnesium in the urine. And so this becomes a, a critical supplementation consideration for an awful lot of the people that we serve in our practices. And so we want to be concerned where medications may be further depleting magnesium, such as the, in the case of diuretics. But what about vitamin D? Uh, we think about vitamin D as being a, a supplement, a vitamin. It's actually a hormone, but it is increasingly being prescribed for um, individuals, at least here in the U.S. And it's a blessing that these types of nutrients might be available via prescription. However, they are often prescribed not only in the D2 form, but also in high bolus weekly dosages. Typically in the U.S., this is 50,000 IUs of vitamin D2 at a time. And like any other nutrient that we consume in very large doses, no nutrient acts alone. Biochemistry in the human body is interactive. And magnesium in particular is a key cofactor for multiple stages of vitamin D metabolism. And so introducing a bolus dose of vitamin D, especially in the prescription form, is going to put a lot of pressure on sufficiency of magnesium. In fact, you may have already discovered people in your practice who start taking this high dose vitamin D and they start having symptoms of toxicity, they might call it, of vitamin D. And often what they're displaying is in fact symptoms of progressive deficiency of magnesium. They start to experience headache, maybe uh, cramping or spasming in their uh, muscles. They may start to struggle with some constipation or some dysmotility in their gut, perhaps some um, acid reflux. And so many of the people in our practices already have borderline status of magnesium. If you introduce this bolus dose of vitamin D, you may... Uh, lower the level of the water and symptoms of this deficiency may surface. At SAFM, we teach about the interconnectedness of nutrients and we teach to ensure magnesium sufficiency before beginning a vitamin D um, supplement. And we also recommend beginning with a lower dose of vitamin D, introducing with just a one or 2000 IU dose at a time on a daily basis and building up to a larger bolus dose. Keep in mind as well that if you're using prescription vitamin D, at least in the U.S., it's the D2 form, which some individuals may struggle to convert to uh, uh, even the 25-hydroxy form, much less the 125-hydroxy form. And so you want to be sure to be checking those levels to ensure that this particular form and this bolus approach to dosage is actually working. For some individuals, it will work well. For under individuals, it will not be well converted or the dearth of cofactors may actually end up surfacing a whole nother set of symptoms. For that matter, 
vitamin D and its various actions um, in the body is not acting alone. We know that in some of the oldest nuclear receptors, vitamin D and vitamin A, right? Um, retinoid uh, is actually taken up coincident. Uh, and so bolus dose of vitamin D can actually put a lot of pressure on and drive depletion of vitamin A. Or we may not have sufficient action of vitamin D at the receptor level, regardless of the blood levels of the hormone, if there is inadequate vitamin A. Uh, we want to be looking at these nutrients uh, in cofactor families, right? Uh, obviously, vitamin A and vitamin D are all, both, we speak of them as being fat-soluble vitamins. But what about vitamin K? Vitamin K1, vitamin K2? Vitamin D, in particular, promotes more calcium uptake into the body, which, of course, is wonderful. We need to activate an awful lot of calcium channels in order to promote all sorts of different physiological functioning in the body. And we need good calcium uptake in order to reinforce and keep our, our body strong, excuse me, our bones uh, strong with mineralization. However, uh, calcium running rogue in the body uh, can be disease promoting. We want to be uh, having optimal levels of calcium in circulation, not excessive levels. And we want to be promoting mineralization of bones, not calcification of soft tissue. And vitamin K2 actually plays a critical role for preventing that by activating different proteins such as uh, matrix GLA protein in our blood vessels that overtly helps to interfere with calcification of soft tissue. This helps to ensure with adequate vitamin K2 that our using vitamin D is safe for our cardiovascular systems. And so again, interconnectedness of nutrients is essential. While this might seem quite complex, and there are indeed many different clusters of nutrients that you want to master, this is something that with repeated study, you absolutely can learn to capably and confidently use in your practice. At SCFM, we not only teach you the science, but we give you case after case after case of real life complex case practice to actually use your knowledge. Uh, in order to assess and design an interventional plan for a unique individual who is an active patient or client in one of your colleagues' practices. Something that we do over and over and over again in our transformational training program in applied functional medicine here at SAFN. Uh, so vitamin D, really essential for immune function and not just for immune strength, but also for immune regulation, which of course brings us into the wide, wide world of immunomodulation. And we know that autoimmune disease is growing both in variety as well as prevalence throughout our practices. And unfortunately, this is something that has become exacerbated uh, during COVID times. And we are increasingly using strong, potent medications that overtly interfere with immune function. Now, we're, of course, I'm speaking of, for example, immunosuppressive medications, whether it's steroids or biologics. These are medications that, like so many other drugs, are blessings. I want to be crystal clear on this point. I am a chemist by first love and passion, and there is so much of an opportunity for better living through chemistry. We're better, we're blessed to live during a time where so many life-saving medications, life-promoting medications are available, especially when we can save a life, we can save a body part. We can stabilize a disease long enough to actually work on the root causes through the functional medicine lens. This is where we don't want to be at odds with uh, allopathic remedies. We simply want to consider them more objectively and more pragmatically as we are considering what type of remedies are going to be best for a unique individual given what they are wrestling with at this time. And so, uh, 
uh, biologics, steroids, these absolutely have their place and it's a blessing that they are available, especially when individuals are really suffering. However, they are not optimal solutions for long-term treatment in the context of an autoimmune disease, for example, where we have the ability to step-by-step -step get at the root causes of the immune dysregulation and reverse them. Primarily because by virtue of suppressing immune function to reduce symptoms and to save body parts, for example, in autoimmune disease, right? We are suppressing inflammation. Uh, we're doing that by impairing immune function. The challenge with that is the majority of autoimmune diseases have at their roots some sort of persistent infectious challenge. And while you are suppressing immune function in order to save a body part, you're suppressing immune function and likely interfering with the immune system's ability to optimally contain and eradicate an infectious challenge that is probably furthering or perpetuating that autoimmune dynamic. Yet another example of a circular pattern of dysfunction where the medication can absolutely provide some uh, short-term or interim solutions. But when we expect to keep using this medication for years and years and decades and decades uh, without expecting it to necessarily create a secondary or a tertiary autoimmune dynamic, or to increase the risk of cancer. Uh, these are known risk factors of these medications. And if you've been working through the functional medicine lens for a while, you likely have seen this in your practice repeatedly because these poly autoimmune dynamics are cases that the conventional lens has a really hard time often dealing with because there's not an adequate set of tools to address them because adding more and more immunosuppressants is not going to get at the roots. Again, it may help to try to further kind of manage the manifestations of these diseases, but unfortunately it's not going to do anything to prevent the further worsening of them over time as we develop other infectious triggers and drivers, especially through molecular mimicry where there, um, there is a cross reactivity between antibodies to a known infectious threat and antibodies to uh, a human tissue that the body obviously should be tolerating. Uh, this molecular pattern is often triggered by bacteria where there is enough molecular similarity between foe and self. Uh, and of course, when we are suppressing the immune system and allowing the infection to continue, then we are not at all getting at the roots of this pattern of disease exacerbation. And so we should logically expect it to continue. And I think realistically, and we've seen this in case after case um, in um, our communities, we expect the development of further autoimmune dynamics, right? It's a good reminder that whether an autoimmune dynamic is active in the thyroid with Hashimoto's or active in the, the brain and central nervous system with say multiple sclerosis or active in the skin or the adrenal gland or the liver or any of these tissues, we focus on it being, oh, it's a disease of the thyroid. It's a disease of the brain. It's a disease of some other gland or organ. But at its root, it's a disease of the immune system. And unless we get at the roots of that dysregulation of the immune system, we should fully, logically, scientifically expect it to worsen and diversify. And this is where we need to stop relying on these medications as the primary long-term solution. Um, steroids uh, are another uh, really significant uh, concern. Uh, and this is true whether it is a swallowed steroid medication or whether it's a topical steroid or yes, an inhaled one. And whether we are inhaling through our mouth or snorting through our nose, what surprises a lot of practitioners to learn is that there is, even with this seemingly localized use, there is still strong evidence of immunosuppressive effects that actually suppress endogenous cortisol response 
as a result of the compensatory glucocorticoid medication. So this means that when you are using a steroid inhaler, right, uh, whether it is um, for asthma uh, or something for a um, chronic, say, allergic rhinitis type of dynamic, you are getting suppression of localized immune function and therefore infectious oversight in the nasal passages, in the throat, in the esophagus, and often down in the gastric cavity. We, we shouldn't be surprised that we find, for example, a worsening of things such as um, uh, fungal thrush in the mouth or H. pylori overgrowth in the gastric cavity or maybe different um, dental infections, right? Oral infections. We are inhaling, we are bringing into this upper respiratory and upper GI cavities a known immunosuppressant. So again, this may help with breathing, it may help with symptoms, it may help with relief, but of course it could easily be promoting or exacerbating an infectious dynamic there. And uh, even though it is being used in a localized fashion, it can still be promoting suppression of endogenous uh, cortisol levels across the entire body. And so this is where what we're doing locally up here in the body may be promoting lack of sufficient anti-inflammatory response, say in our knee joints or in our hip joints and contributing to more aches and pains, contributing to more damage of these soft tissues due to the buildup of inflammation. And so important interconnectedness to consider for unique individuals. Uh, another common medication that is used, right, when we are talking about getting at the roots of uh, immune hypervigilance or immune dysregulation, when we are getting at the roots of the challenges, are various antibiotics. Now, this can be a prescribed antibiotic. It might be a selective one. It might be a broad spectrum. But even herbal antimicrobials, right? I'm always surprised to see how many practitioners and certainly how many patients in their practices assume that because it's natural, because it comes from herbs, it's innocuous, it's benign. You can just keep taking it two or three times a day on an ongoing basis or on a preventative basis. And of course, that is not true. Uh, antibiotics, especially broad spectrum antibiotics are particularly intense in not only decimating what might be a pathogenic microbe, whether it's a novel pathogen or some type of commensal uh, overgrowth that has started to have pathogenic effects. Uh, we are wiping out, of course, all of the commensals um, as well as the perceived pathogens. And this in and of itself, decimation of commensals promotes immune dysregulation promotes immune dysregulation, which should really help us to call into question, where do we absolutely need to use an antibiotic versus where would a good potent probiotic and a focus on supporting good prebiotic factors actually be more effective because we allow the immune system to maintain the innate regulatory effects of having good supportive diverse commensals. We're not helping the immune system to establish good long-term regulation by wiping out all of our commensals. Again, we're very blessed to have antibiotics in our toolbox. If we are dealing with a truly novel pathogen, uh, that is uh, promoting dramatic disease effects. But we've got to progressively continue to move away from uh, having the go-to solution be an antibiotic every time we have a concern about something infectious because we are progressively promoting more and more immune dysregulation with every course of antibiotics. And I can't tell you how many cases of autoimmune disease I have seen that started with a course of antibiotics that wiped out commensals, that had an erosive effect on the mucosa in the intestines, that promoted loss of barrier function and then enhanced intestinal permeability and increased activation of 
and F-kappa B and other in pro-inflammatory regulators that set a person up for systemic immune dysregulation. So often a person's story about how they got as sick as they are today begins with, well, I took this medication and antibiotics are often at the roots. But the reality is that excessive, even herbal antimicrobials can also be a problem uh, in this particular area. And so we also want to think, even with caution, where do herbal antimicrobials make good sense? Uh, where we need to really try to wipe some things out versus where do we actually want to just boost our own innate immune function? Using a probiotic, using prebiotics where appropriate, ensuring optimal levels of vitamin D and vitamin A and zinc, for example, and work on good deep rest and activation of a parasympathetic immune, uh, nervous system mode, which is the only place that any resilient healing happens anyway. Promoting good deep restful sleep. Um, when people start to feel a little bit better, teaching them that that's not the time to get right back to their disease promoting lifestyle, right? After the surface evidence of the disease has disappeared is the time when healing actually begins. And that requires that we set aside space and time and a parasympathetic nervous system mode in order to allow that. So often disease becomes chronic because the moment people feel just a little bit better, they jump right back to what they were doing before that promoted the disease they were suffering with. It seems so obvious, perhaps on the surface, but without your education and inspiration, uh, your patient will likely continue to perpetuate this pattern of behavior on an ongoing basis and suffer quite a bit because of it. Uh, and so we want to be mindful, right? Uh, when we're using these types of antimicrobials, especially prescription antibiotics, we're often wiping out 90% of the incredibly precious, wildly diverse microbiome that serves as the, the a critical layer of defense uh, and immune function, especially in our guts. Now, when we are talking about uh, what is wreaking havoc in the gut and what might be promoting enhanced intestinal permeability, we're going to talk about a lot of medications, but of course we need to talk about the elephant in the room, which is painkillers. We have to talk about non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and how often people are just popping a pill on a daily basis. I cannot believe the number of people who take uh, ibuprofen every night just to help them sleep or even worse, some sort of blank PM version, which is going to be some sort of inset plus Benadryl, uh, typically, and that's a whole nother topic that we may get have time to get uh, to today in terms of the progressive cognitive dysfunction that can result from ongoing use of Benadryl. But um, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs have immediate erosive effects on the intestinal lining. Even with the first few doses, this is not something that people have to take for months and months and years and years in order to wreak havoc on their ability to absorb nutrients via the intestin intestinal barrier in order to fortify the body and run all of our biochemistry, but also overtly promoting, again, loss of barrier function and immune dysregulation. We want to be looking for other anti-inflammatory alternatives where people are wrestling with pain. And this is where solutions such as curcumin and bromelain, boswellia, uh, white willow bark, uh, quercetin. Course, uh, there are so many agents that can have marked effects in terms of pain relief without these particular negative effects on the gut. And another great example of unfortunately how often and the many ways in which disease can begin in the gut. Uh, we absolutely want to be looking for alternatives. Uh, individuals have even struggled from um, internal bleeding uh, as a result of using these medications and not just with aspirin, uh, but also with uh, ibuprofen. The other alternative we know people may move to is acetaminophen, 
which can be overtly liver toxic with ongoing use because it dramatically increases glutathione demands from the liver uh, in order to uh, support you know, further, further pain relief. White willow bark does, it's actually um, the original inspiration for aspirin, uh, but actually a derivative of salicylic acid is only one ingredient found in white willow bark. And it's found in about uh, 5% concentration relative to the medication. And it's actually the synergistic effect of that very low concentration of the salicylic, salicylic a derivative with a number of other phytonutrients that actually allows white willow bark to be effective. So certainly you could take gargantuan doses of white willow bark and it would have the same effects of aspirin. But when taken in the, the typical supplement types of doses, it can actually be really quite effective without the same risks for those same um, mucosal damage effects, right? It's a great question, right? Uh, in terms of nuanced effect. And also a great reminder that phytonutrients that we find in herbs very seldom act alone, right? Because they're found in a plant by the hundreds, right? If we were to look at a certain herbal leaf or an herbal root or an herbal berry or fruit, we would not find one or two phytonutrients that are helpful. We find hundreds of them, right? A stalk of broccoli or an, an apple has several hundred phytonutrients in them, which have synergistic effects. When we take one of those and purify it and amplify it a hundred or a thousand fold to get a patentable medication, we are dealing with a completely different substance in terms of its biochemical effects. Um, so, uh, let's see, where do we want to go next? Um, in terms of, um, other, um, common medications, let's switch from talking about the effects on the immune system in the intestines to talk about malabsorption of critical nutrients. Metformin, incredibly widespread uh, medication in, in use for type 2 diabetes and various types of metabolic uh, dysfunction or progressive metabolic syndrome. Now, metformin, uh, again, is a blessing like so many other medications. It's one of the few drugs for metabolic disease that actually is, <clears throat> to some degree, getting at the roots of dysfunction and trying to actually affect insulin resistance rather than trying to simply uh, keep blood sugar from being elevated, which again, the, the mode of action for doing that by increasing insulin is often worsening metabolic disease behind the scenes. Uh, this is the case for other, um, the vast majority actually of other type two, B, type two diabetes medications. But unfortunately, one of the most insidious effects of metformin is in the small intestines, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically in the ileum. It overtly interferes with the calcium channel effects that would enable us to absorb vitamin B12. You want to be looking for and suspecting subclinical vitamin B12 deficiency in every single one of your patients and clients who is using metformin on an ongoing basis. And you don't just want to look for a clinically low B12 because the reference range for B12 is skewed incredibly low. You ideally want individual serum B12 levels to be way up in the upper third of the normal range or even clinically high um, because vitamin B12 is essential, obviously, for mitochondrial function, in particular for nervous function, as a critical cofactor for methylation. And you can take lots of B12. You can get it from your food. You can well digest it. You can have plenty of stomach acid. You can have plenty of intrinsic factor. It's bound. It's moving down through the intestines already, all prepared to be absorbed in the ileum. And then there's metformin. And it interferes with calcium being able to activate the uptake of B12 into the ileum. And so you're not going to see this. Uh, people may be consuming plenty of B12, right? You can't, you can't identify this from looking at the diet or looking at the high dose supplement they're taking. This is a great example that we are not what we eat. 
We are what we eat, digest, absorb, convert to final forms, and actually get past the cell membrane. And I've seen metformin contribute to some really dramatic uh, B12 deficiency with ongoing use. Now, another common problem with metformin is that it can promote diarrhea. And diarrhea can also promote nutrient malabsorption because rapid transit time can easily lead to inadequate exposure um, of nutrients to the opportunity to be absorbed in the small intestines. And then we can end up with actually losing an awful lot of, in particular, our essential fats or fat-soluble vitamins or our minerals like magnesium. We can lose them in our stool when we have uh, excessively rapid transit time uh, due to metformin. And so this is something you want to keep in mind and be on the lookout for. It's a blessing as a medication, but we only want to use metformin for a little and as short a time as possible while we're working on helping people to adopt step-by-step -step lifestyle change to get at the roots of the insulin resistance and reverse it. This is one of the disease dynamics that if the patient is ready, willing, and able to make lifestyle change, we see this happen on a daily basis. It's incredibly common. It's one of the easier disease dynamics to work on reversing if you have excellent uh, clinical partnership with your patient. Um, and so medications can be part of the solution, but when we rely on them to be the end all single point solution, we may be providing short term relief. That is important. We may be providing some type of a arresting of a truly pathological uh, dynamic, which is important. But we may also, with time, simply be worsening the very disease that we're trying to treat or promoting an entirely separate uh, secondary disease dynamic. And so these are challenges you want to be looking for in your practice uh, on an ongoing basis. But I hope this has been helpful for you. Absolutely do a good, deep, thorough inquiry about medications in your intake. And even beyond what they list on an intake form, ask about over-counter medications they may not have listed, things that they may not even think about as being a drug. A lot of people don't even think about ibuprofen as being a medication because it's kind of this weird prescriptive category that they feel self-empowered to use. And I can go to CVS and buy it at will, so it can't be that dangerous, right? Well, as we know, nothing could be further than the truth. Birth control pills, right? I could have kept talking about so many other medications today that have downstream insidious effects. SSRI antidepressants, uh, birth control uh, pills, um, uh, proton pump inhibitors and H2 receptor blockers, right? Oh, so common medications that have downstream disease promoting effects that you need to know. It's a great example of the nuanced clinical application uh, detail that we include richly in our training at SAFM. And so if what I've shared today resonates with you, I encourage you to check out our training programs at SAFM and see if they're a perfect fit for your advanced training needs. Thank you so much for joining me. Happy studying.